Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 221, featuring the first installment of a brand new interview series with Mr. Seth Robinson, the creator of Legend of the Red Dragon BBS door game and Dink Smallwood. This first part of the interview, we talk about his history, how he learned to program, how he got his first BBS off the ground, and much, much more. A lot of great stuff to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Seth Robinson. All right, folks, I am here with the great Seth Robinson, the guy behind Robinson Technologies. Now, he's been an indie developer now for 24 years. And if you were at all active on the BBS scene back in the 90s, you've probably played one of this uh, man's games here. He's responsible for Legend of the Red Dragon. The I'll go so far as to say that is the best BBS door game of all time. He's also uh, responsible for one of the funniest CRPGs of all time, game called Dink Smallwood. How are you doing today, Seth? Hey, I'm doing fantastic. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm really impressed with the quality of the feed, considering you're all the way in Japan. Yeah, we have good internet, 100 megabits. So, so what do we have, like uh, 1,200 baud or 300 baud? Yeah, yeah. I remember those days, yeah. Uh, so what's your latest projects? What are you working on these days? Uh, I've done a lot of um, games for mobile and PC. The new one is Gritopia. Uh, it's on four platforms. Multiplayer, a freemium multiplayer game that is uh, doing really well. So real happy with that. Uh, most successful game that I've ever done, actually, and even beats Lord. So there you go. Wow, I was just looking at the Gr Grotopia. Is that how you say it? Grotopia? Grotopia, yeah. I was just looking at the website for that uh, for the page and it said there were 3,000 people online you know, at yeah. the moment. I mean, that's that's got to be... You said that's even more popular than uh, Lord of the, or Legend of the Red Dragon then. In, well, yeah. Um, it's, it's made more money, I can say. And with Lord, multiplayer interaction was always what I was going for. And now to be able to push it up to these numbers, um, uh, it's a lot of fun. So how, how would you describe that game? Sort of, a, it looks a little bit like uh, some, I guess, uh, what Terrarium, Minecraft, that sort of thing. It, it, it is a kind of like that in that you can build and destroy things, but less emphasis on exploration and random generation. Everything is player created. Um, it has a functional economy. Everything is all worlds are connected. The player run stock markets. Some people there's there's so many ways to play it because players are given a lot of control. I think more than other games, players can ruin the game, harass people, um, psychologically manipulate people. There's a it's a game within a game within a game. So it played many different ways and hard to describe. Yeah, I noticed your catchphrase for it was "weird is good." Right. Yeah, it's definitely weird. You did that one uh, with Mike uh, Hamel or Hamel yes. of uh, Hamamoo Software. So, yes, yeah. you guys have a have a bit of history. Yeah, he's uh, he's a lot like me in that he's been doing indie games for ever, and yeah, we finally. Uh, I don't usually group up with anyone because I don't know. I'm a hermit. I just do stuff by myself. But actually, working with someone else, it, it was a lot of fun. Really worked well. I saw on Wikipedia that apparently at some point you were running a video game arcade. Is, are you yeah. still doing that? Do you have a... Uh, no, but for a couple of years. Uh, yeah, we... Next Gen Gaming in Salem, Oregon. Uh, you could go in. We had... I think we had 24 machines. And you could sit down and play Quake, Total Annihilation. What, what was the hot games of those days? Or was that the 90s? Late 90s? Uh, yeah, once the internet mm, speed got better, uh, local area network gaming centers like that, I think, kind of died off. So we could probably quit at about the right time. How did you get started with video game development? Uh, I was... Well, to understand, let me just say I was homeschooled by super fundy Christian parents. So I had a that lot that of... That might explain the YouTube channel then. Uh, you found my, my <laughs> crazy Christian videos? Yeah. Uh, I'm with you. I, I love my parents. Don't get me wrong, but I had a lot of free time. 
you know, being homeschooled. You, you do school for an hour and the rest of the day, what do you do? You sit on your butt. So I got uh, this Commodore 16 and I think I was about 12, 11. Now for those who might not be familiar, this, this, is, this is a machine not to be confused with the Commodore 64, right? Right. As I understand it, it actually came out after the 64, like the super cheap crapo version with 16K RAM. And they got, my parents got that free for looking at a campground, one of those type of deals. <laughs> and I just, I was in love. You know, even with 16K, I typed in all these basic programs, nothing else to do all day. We, I think we didn't have a TV for like seven years to give you an idea of, you know, the level of, of my parents' um, beliefs. Uh, TV bad. Awesome. Nothing Dungeons good. and Dragons, devil worship, that sort of thing. Right, exactly. Dungeons and Dragons. Oh man, they were part of that. The scare. If you <laughs> if you remember those days, it was there were warnings in all their newsletters. Don't play Dungeons and Dragons. Um, everyone commits suicide. Who does that? And that's what my parents really believed. So, uh, yeah, no, I got in with that and learned basic. And uh, to be honest, I I always was. Um, it, well, I don't want to say always, but I was just a horrible programmer. And I'm really lucky that in those days, text games were acceptable because, man, I could never, I could never do anything else. In those days, you know, I should say. I got a little bit better. <laughs> but yeah, Commodore. And then I went to the Commodore 128, uh, which, of course, you just, I played all the 64 games. That's all you could really do. And then to the Amiga. So you've pretty, yeah. been, been pretty much a Commodore guy all along. Then. Right. I went up the Commodore ladder, and at some point, in, you, were, you had an Amiga. I, oh, I yeah, noticed the yeah. picture on, your, on the Facebook same, page. Same trajectory, except we went from, I think we started with the VIC-20 instead of the uh, 16. Right, VIC-20. Yeah, so after a while, I mean, I really wanted a video toaster and all that stuff for the Amiga, and then finally I had to go PC, like everyone kind of did eventually. Join the dark side, so to speak. Yep. So what was the Amiga that you had? I had a 2000 uh, with a hard drive, which in those days, it was a pretty good deal. I think I paid 1600 under some kind of academic thing. You could get a discount. I guess adjusted for inflation, that would be something like $30,000 today. Yeah, yeah. That, that was a lot of cash. I mean, especially after the cheapness of the 128 which was like, I think, 500 bucks with the disk drive. Well, considering how, I guess, uh, you know, now that we sort of know a little bit about your background, I guess it kind of makes sense with this hermit lifestyle that you would be attracted to the BBS scene. Yeah, exactly. Being able to make a call and have my modem connect was mind-blowing to me at that time. I mean, it was kind of pre-internet that I could access, so... Yeah, I played a lot of door games, trade wars, and just uh, hours and hours per day playing games. Well, I'm going to assume that most people that watch this show probably know what a BBS is, but you know, just in case, you know, what, 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 how would you explain that concept to somebody? You, you uh, probably end the situation more often than I am, right? Sure. Uh, BBS stands for Bulletin Board System, uh, an electronic system that one guy sets up at his house. Uh, I ran one and then people call on a normal phone line to connect and, and uh, write messages, leave messages, read messages and play simple games and the thing about this was it was so fun to have people, it felt like they were coming into your house or when you were calling you were going into someone else's house and I would uh, I ran my own BBS and at like 3 a.m., I would get a phone call, and you would hear this noise, very sp distinctive sound of your 300 baud modem connecting to someone, and I would jump up and look, and who is it? Spy on them. You could watch what they were doing and break into chat. Be like, hi, uh, are you finding everything okay? You know, who are you? And with BBSs, only one, one guy could be on one phone line, so unless you had eight phone lines and a good system. I, I did later, but you would, you would need that guy to log off for the next guy to log on. So there, that was a huge bottleneck in those days compared to the kids' internet today. And you could, so you could only get 
like 100 calls a day or 200 calls. And some people would stay online for an hour to play the games. So you had to limit people's uh, playtime. And yeah, it was a lot of fun. And the big difference in those days was everyone was pretty local to you. So whenever you had a feud or a fight with someone, which happened, I mean, especially me, I was, you know, 14 or 13, and uh, trolling, I guess, in those days, it was just being invented or something on the internet. But people could actually figure out where you live and go to your house. So you got to be more careful. I mean, I'm surprised it wasn't a bigger thing. Like today, internet security and stalking stalking and all this on Facebook is well known and understood. But in those days, my parents had no idea what I was doing. And I would leave, I would take the car at like midnight and go meet up with people at Denny's that I'd never met, 16 of us, and all the time. So I guess horribly dangerous in Where retrospect. Where was this, this happening in Salem? Salem, Oregon. Yeah. Salem, Oregon. Is that that's not the, is that the home of the witch trials and all that, or is that? Uh, that? no, no. <laughs> I was in Massachusetts, but oh. my parents would have been a part of that. Most likely. <laughs> yeah, if I saw uh, somewhere where a girl came all the way from her Hawaii to visit you. Yeah, yeah. Wow, we're, um, that's true. That is very true. Yuri, where is she now? I don't know, but uh, yep. I think that was the, oh no, a couple of times. Yeah, that happened a couple of times where uh, usually a, a kid and his dad would say, can we just say hi and you know get our picture taken? Only like three or four times. But yeah, that's oh, so a big sort of compliment. Like the, sort of like the local celebrity of this burgeoning scene. Um, yeah, in, in the nerd, you know, geek world, uh, I guess I did go to the BBS meetings. We had this kind of association. And I don't, I don't know. I, once Lord became more popular, then they, they did say, oh, yeah, you're that guy who made that one door game. Okay, so what is the door game? I guess we should define that. All right. Well, um, your standard BBS usually only had a message board and files to download. A door game was like a plug-in that allowed the user to launch another, other software and play a game with other players and in the beginning most games um, were kind of sequentially you had to log on and play and so nothing was real time but later it got a little more advanced and Lord 2 um, you could actually fight other players in real time or chat and so one BBS could have 20 door games and you would look at this list and choose oh I think I'll try to play this one or this one and the key to door games that's different from today's games are everything is based around the idea to limit your time, to get in, do your turns, and then log off. So there's no World of Warcraft uh, playing all day and dying in a you know, Korean cafe or something because you played, you were so addicted. You would play your 15 turns in 10 minutes, and then you'd be done. And you'd go, okay, I have to log on tomorrow to get more turns. And door games were pretty much always free. Like, no, mm, a few exceptions. Like playing Doom over, over BBS's. Yeah, they actually figured out how to do that, and I had to pay a subscription to that. But mostly free. And that was door games. That was the best thing in town at that time. So what were some of your favorite door games that you played before you started working on your own? I mean, you mentioned, I think, I think Trade Wars already. Right. Uh, I'd, I'd say Trade Wars was number one. Um, I think there were other space trading games but the nice thing about Trade Wars was instead of a grid you know you're at XY everything was connected by this kind of network of tunnels and and instead of just playing the, the simple game mechanics they added on this element of uh, mm, character and story and things like that. So the games I liked were, were the ones that had something extra. Uh, so I was in. I was really into Trade Wars, and I played some Food Fight and Ninja. <laughs> I remember Food Fight. <laughs> right, and and these are. I took a lot of inspiration from these because Food Fight really um, had the same mechanics as the games I later made, which is 
hit points, attack, turns per day. And both Food Fight and Ninja, I think, had that. And I, I remember playing something called Cripple Smash, which I know just in today's environment would probably not fly. You, you, these games were horrible, and there were no I, I bet you Rockstar could probably make something like that. I, man, I don't know. It, it even pushed the limit for them, but yeah, probably. Um, but there were no ratings, and BBSs uh, a lot of the time didn't even ask your age. Not that they could verify it anyway. Well, same as websites today, I guess. But so we, yeah, we just played all the stuff. Um, I did. I'm trying to remember any other uh, games I played a lot, but Trade Wars that was the big one. Well, did you st- start your own BBS before or after Lord? Uh, before, before I, I started it on my Commodore 64 and then with a disk drive. So you could only save like, you know, 300 messages or something. It was, it was horrible. Then I got the Amiga and I found some Amiga software and I couldn't compete with the other BBSs in town that were running on PC because they could run Trade Wars. Trade Wars didn't work on the Amiga. There was no port. So I had to write my own door and I found uh, a C compiler and I figured out how to do it from some example somewhere and, and hacked it up and made the super simple door uh, which I called Legend of the Red Dragon um, Inn, the tavern. Red Dragon Inn I think is how it started. And all you could do is leave one liner messages and flirt with the barmaid. And I was the only one in town who had that specific door game. So uh, I kept working on that. And that, that's really where Lord was made, on the Amiga. Um, I think, I'm trying to think. I think I ran it for like a year. And you were Just me. about 14 years old at this time? Yeah. So what, you know, you, where'd you come up with this flirting mechanic? Well, being a pubescent kid <laughs> with no experience at all in romantic areas, I guess that was my twisted idea of how it worked. You flirt with the girl once a day and build up your charm points or something. And finally, of course, she'll you know kiss you and love you. That's all you have to do. And at the, now that I look back, um, I guess it's sort of weird that you know, every everyone flirts with the same, <laughs> the same barmaid, and uh, hmm. yeah, no, it comes from a kid's mind, and uh, most of the players, I think, were also kids, so that probably. Um, I was wondering what kind of sense. what kind of people were logging in and playing this. Yeah, you just had yeah. a good time watching them play too, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I, having your own BBS is to watch the ant farm. And to be the digital god of the empire. And you can see what's going on. You can read private messages. Not that I would, of course. But uh, <laughs> so, so now when I, when I have a game like Retopia, it's the same thing on a different level. I mean, on a weekend, we have 6,000 players. And you can watch, you know, I watch them just like I did in the VBS days. I mean, this is making me sound like a creepy stalker. I don't, I don't sit around watching everyone, but... Just, uh, it is a lot of fun to kind of be able to control it and find the bad guys. And, you know, you kind of, you do have to police it. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back uh, next week with part two of my interview with Seth. A lot of great stuff coming up. We really haven't even gotten into Legend of the Red Dragon. Plus there's Dink Smallwood and much, much more. So stay tuned for that. I know you will enjoy it. As always, I want to thank you very, very much if you have supported me and my show. If you want to become a supporter of Matt Chat, all I ask is $1 per week. Just go to mattchat.us and look for the support the show in the menu there. There's also some games for you to play in a nice blog. Oh, a forum even. A lot of fun stuff to keep you occupied if you want more Matt Chat than just what's here. Uh, but any, anyway, whatever you guys do, I very, very much appreciate it and thank you. Now what about that ale of the week? Well, funny you should ask. Uh, this week I've got a little something called t- Tongue Tied. Tongue Tied. Uh, the Thai is like the country, Thailand. 
Uh, this is uh, from the Blue Moon Company. You probably had their uh, Blue Moons before. Uh, this is apparently a special brew with lemongrass and basil. So, I don't know. Sounds kind of interesting. I really like basil in my cooking, so uh, we'll see how it works as a brew. It's got a 7.5% uh, 7 alcohol, so not too bad. Uh, ale brewed with lemongrass and basil. Taste responsibly. Apparently this is uh, something whipped up by their brewmaster, Keith, and part of the graffiti collection. Anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this Blue Moon Tongue Tied here in the this rather excellent drinking horn. Uh, I've been smelling it a little bit. It's <laughs> you can definitely smell something peculiar going on in this brew. You definitely smell the lemongrass. Uh, maybe a hint of basil in there. Definitely the lemongrass is uh, standing out a lot more than the the basil. Probably a good thing. Anyway, let's give it a taste. <laughs> That's a pretty complicated aroma there. You definitely, okay, I'm tasting that basil a lot more than I smelled it. Very, uh, you know, herbal type of <laughs> uh, taste here. A lot of that, you know, you can taste the basil, you can taste that lemongrass. Um, <laughs> you don't even really taste the ale. Let me try it again. <sighs> yeah, it's a very... Uh, very herb. You, ta you taste all those herbs in here very strongly. It's kind of high up uh, in the in the palate there. Not much of an alcohol kick at all to this. Just really taste those, uh, that lemongrass and basil. Very hits you pretty hard. Let me try it one one more time. Yeah, that's basically it. You can you can taste a little bit of the the hops there at the end, but. Uh, they really concentrated the flavors of that uh, lemongrass and, and the basil. It's a very interesting, uh, I, dare I say, unique uh, flavored ale here. wasn't really what I was expecting at all. Um, it doesn't taste anything like the normal Blue Moon, uh, you know, if you've had those. Uh, do I like it, though? You know, it's, it's, uh, I like a lot of variety, so this is definitely something different. So I'm going to go four out of five drinking horns on this. It's not bad if you're kind of bored, I guess, with the other uh, sorts of stuff out there. This would be something interesting to try. I don't know uh, very much about Thai, Thailand, or Thai food or anything, so who knows if this is uh, authentic or reminiscent of that. But anyway, it's not bad, and it's definitely something different. So uh, four out of five drinking horns. Okay, uh, what about the quotation? All right, so the quotation this week comes from Bill Vaughn, and it goes uh, sort of ties in nicely, I think, to... Uh, Seth and I, uh, our discussion about youth and sort of innocence and flirtation and all that sort of stuff. And it goes something like this. Youth is when you're allowed to stay up New Year's Eve. Middle age is when you're forced to. See you guys next week. So this will probably be the last Matt Chat you see before uh, the Christmas holiday. So just wanted to wish you all a very Merry Christmas and uh, good luck with some great uh, retro games, maybe some computer role-playing games under the tree. Have a Merry Christmas. <laughs>